Okay, so <laughs> I realize that I haven't done very many um, people in history. So I decided to do a silent film star who she had a very mysterious death and her death turned into one of the first, well it was the first Hollywood scandal. I'm talking about Olive Thomas. So, Olive Thomas, she was born in 1894, she died in 1920, and she started as a model in 1914. And her career as a model, she won the Most Beautiful Girl in New York City contest, um, Howard Chandler Christie, um, ran that contest. He was a very well-known artist and illustrator. For the day he was established in New York. So, after winning that contest, Olive Thomas, um, posed and modeled for several different well-known um, people. She was like a, an artist model. Modeling back then isn't what it is now. <laughs> you didn't model for a photographer and just have your, um, have your picture taken and then you have your face splashed everywhere wasn't so much that you were either a artist model or a photographer model it, there were two different um because there was painting was still very big back then so um anyway she was featured on several different magazines. She was on, um, let me look. I actually have one of them, if I can find it. The movie magazines of the time, she showed up. Mary Pickford was on, I don't remember it. I'm not gonna bother looking it up. Um, Photoplay was one of them. Now, Photoplay is a lot like the photo magazines that we have now. Photoplay would kind of meld the artist um, technique with photography. So they were still doing that stuff. It was like Photoshop back then. <laughs> and they would show celebrities of the day. It wasn't just silent film. Uh, silent film stars. The movie... Uh, magazines was just silent film a lot of times oh, they showed Rudolph Valentino so many I think there were like five six covers of him <laughs> Mary Pickford showed up a lot um yeah if you were popular you showed up a lot it's that hasn't changed <laughs> but she showed up a couple times Olive did and um so she showed up in that. The one, another one that she showed up in was Saturday Evening Post. And, um, which was a very popular magazine for the time. It was kind of like Vogue of the day, because Vogue is pretty popular now. Yeah, it was considered the Vogue of then. <laughs> So, um, she decided to move on from modeling, and she decided to move on to stage. Well, guess what her stage was? She became a Zegfield girl. Now, one thing you have to understand about Zegfield follies in 
the 50s and 60s, a lot of times they will show, like, the um, fancy outfits, you know, dripping with fringe and um, beads and feathers and... And when you look at the ones from the 20s, yeah, they're pretty weird, but... <laughs> In the teens and 20s, the routines were dirty and raunchy. It was a gentleman's place to be. By about, I think even the 40s, 50s, 60s, because I think, I don't know when it ended. Oh, it was done in 31. I got thrown off because I remember it being shown in a lot of those musicals. <laughs> Durr. But anyway, um... Well, that can't be right. Well, maybe... What do I know? Well, I'll figure that out later. But anyway... <laughs> It was considered a gentleman's place to go and get excited. <laughs> That's the thing to understand about Zegfeld Follies. And so when you see the outfits, yeah, I know that a lot of you, when you see the, like, the burlesque dancers from, like, the 1890s, you're like, that. there's nothing wrong with that. Well, when you showed your ankle, you were considered a slut. <laughs> Times have changed. And, um, because they had those large pantaloon outfits that they had to wear at the beach. Yeah, that changed by the 20s. Anyway, so Florence Zegfield, or Florenz, uh, anyway, we'll just call him Zegfield. And this is Florence Eggfield Jr. By this time, Senior, I think, was gone. I'm not even going to bother looking it up. But he hired Olive. And in 1915, she made her stage debut. She became an, a favorite immediately. Everyone loved her. And... Her popularity was so much that she went, she immediately moved up to what was called the Midnight Frolic. <laughs> the Midnight Frolic was possibly the dirtiest show. <laughs> In fact, it was. It was the after hour show, which tells you everything. <laughs> um, and like it says here, it was a show for famous male patrons who had plenty of money to bestow on the young and beautiful female performers. <laughs> and she you know, a lot of those girls would receive gifts and, you know, I mean, that happens in stage everywhere. Um, you receive, an, you know, you get admirers and you receive gifts, male and female alike. Well, it was happening back then as well. And unfortunately, that can get out of control and people can spread rumors. Nobody knows if it's true or not. Somebody said that the German ambassador of the t at the time gave her a string of pearls that was worth $10,000. Nobody knows if that's true or not. You know. But she was well she was very pretty. I mean, <laughs> you look her up, she was a very lovely lady. And um <laughs> unfortunately, 
She knew it. <laughs> Florence, the owner of Zegfeld, was married to the actress Billy Burke. Who, if you don't know who that is, she was Glenda the Good Witch in the film Wizard of Oz in the 30s. <laughs> Not the silent films, but the one with uh, Judy Garland. So, Olive started an affair with him. But he was known for having affairs with all the girls and everything, but she was a favorite. <laughs> and, um, the affair ended because Olive got angry at the fact that he wouldn't leave Billy for her. So... It was, <laughs> so they had kind of a brief affair. Nobody knows if Billy actually knew. I kind of figure that she did. She did. I can imagine. So she stayed, she, how, despite having the brief affair and, and breaking it off. Of course, I don't know if she broke it off or he broke it off or, you know, whatever happened. Um, oh, it says here she did. <laughs> Helps if I read. So, she continued with Zegfeld. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, you had people, you had men absolutely in love with you. You were getting gifts. And she decided to go back to modeling. There was a, um illustrator at the time named Alberto Vargas. She was the very first to become a part of a series called The Vargas Girls. And she posed nude, all the girls did. And he, he is a Peruvian artist, by the way. And let me see. Well, I, I'm not going to show it because I won't be able to chop it. So <laughs> last thing I need is for YouTube to scream at me. <laughs> Otherwise, I would show it. But I will put the name in the description so you can look it up. The name of the painting is Memoirs of Olive. And... You know, nobody really knows what happened to the actual painting. Some people say that Zegville wanted it, put it in his office. Others claim that Vargas never gave it to him and kept it for himself. Yeah, it's just one big thing after another. And um, Vargas did say that Olive Thomas was one of the most beautiful women that Zegfeld ever glorified. So, um, so in her modeling career, she was glorified, and in her stage um, career, she was glorified. So she had it pretty good. <laughs> Then she moves on to silent film. Um, now the thing about silent film, one thing you have to understand is there's oh, what a lot of directors did. Um, it's kind of like what's happening now. I don't know how to explain it. Um, sort of like what Marvel and Star Wars are doing. Um, she Her on-screen debut was for a series titled Beatrice Fairfax, and she was in episode 10. Okay, so what a lot of directors would do is they would have this series, and they would title it, and they would have episodes. 
uh, George Millais, who I've talked about a lot of his film. I've critiqued a few of his films. He did that with several of his, uh, some of his earlier stuff. Um, and sometimes that was for documentation more than anything else. But anyway, yeah, you would have these series and you would have the episodes. And you wouldn't really title the episodes back then. So, um, yeah, she appeared in one episode and then her first full length feature, de feature film debut was A Girl Like That. And it was for Paramount Pictures. So basically, what I mean by films like today, like with Marvel, you have Captain America, and then the episodes would be like First Avenger, Winter Soldier, and uh, Civil War. So it's kind of along the same lines, but they are feature length. Well, I think these are feature length too. I did look up Beatrice Fairfax. You can find it on DVD. Um, Girl like that, you can't. So that's a little sad. So, also in 1917, news broke out of her engagement to Jack Pickford, who is married. Uh, who is not married? Jack Pick Pickford is the brother of Mary Pickford. Once the news of the engagement broke out, it turned out that they had to admit that they had been married for a year. <laughs> of course. The marriage had been kept secret because both of them did not want to, um, more Thomas than anyone else, did, did not want people to think that her success in film was due to her association with the Pickfords. So, <laughs> um, okay, I don't want to rush anything, so I'll hold my tongue on that for a little bit. So she made quite a few films, actually. Um, she, <laughs> she did really well in movies, and what's funny is that for fearing that people would think that she needed her husband, that she needed Jack, I think they only appeared in two movies together. So I, I can't remember if it was one or two. And she was actually really smart in her decisions on um, staying with a, a company, leaving a company, and that sort of thing. A lot of times it... Uh, women in that, at that time, didn't make the best decisions. And I don't mean that to sound bad, but they just didn't. Uh, Marie Prevost, she started out, um, that I talked about before, she started out really smart, and then it was like the alcoholism after she lost her mom. Just, she was making really terrible decisions. There were a couple other bathing beauties. It was like they were so dependent on Max Sennett, that they just, they couldn't do that. And that was a usual thing. You know, you want to make it big in Hollywood, but you, you're just going blind. You just don't know what to do. <laughs> Once you become a star, what, what are you supposed to do after that? <laughs> you know, even back then, they didn't really know how to deal with stardom. And uh, the artist kind of showed that. The movie The Artist sort of showed that. It, it can be cutthroat. So in 1920, she appeared, uh, Olive appeared, and she had done several movies. She was also still on stage, I believe. She did some stage productions. She was no longer in The Follies at this point. After she married Jack, she left The Follies, but she was on stage. She was doing stage productions. 
And uh, so in 1920, she appeared in a film called The Flapper, which I'm going to look up and um, critique one of these days. <laughs> so here's the thing about The Flapper. The, the point of the movie itself, just a brief little thing, is there's a teenage school girl who wants to be, who wants to find excitement beyond her small town. She was the first actress to portray a flapper on screen. So it, nobody had ever seen or had an idea of what a flapper looked like. So she, because of this film, she was considered the first flapper. And it gave, it kind of opened up the flapper lifestyle or the, the flapper um, culture in a way. Because after this movie was released, it was like, because that's pretty much how it goes, you know, a movie or music is released and then all of a sudden people kind of latch on to it. <laughs> So Frances Marion was the one who wrote the movie. She also wrote Son of the Sheik. I thought she wrote The Sheik as well, but I don't see it here. Um, she also did Pollyanna um, that I with Mary Pickford and The Toll of the Sea, which I just finished. Yeah, there's some. Let me check this really quick. Who wrote it? It doesn't say. Okay. <laughs> it just bothers me. I could have sworn that it was. Princess Marion that wrote the sheet because I thought she had association with both. But it says that Frances Marion was responsible for bringing the term into American, American um, culture, basically. So she, the term flapper is because of Frances Marion. <laughs> so we can thank her for that. Um... The movie The Flapper was extremely popular, so again, I'll have to watch it, and I'm surprised I haven't yet. <laughs> and um, it was one of her more popular films. But you know, when there's a film that has something like that that's different, <laughs> Her final film was called Everybody's Sweetheart, and it was released in October. And it was actually released a month after her death. All right, so that was her career. Now, when you look into her personal life, Jack was not her first marriage. <laughs> her first marriage was kind of one of those, you know, your teenage whirlwind romance. And that's actually how she got the last name Thomas. Everyone knows her as Olive Thomas, so that's what I call her by. Um, I don't even remember her last name, her um, birth last name. So she met Bernard Thomas at the age of 15, and they got married in 1911. And basically, in, in, yeah, in 1913, they separated as she decided to move to New York City to pursue her 
modeling career. And then in 1915, they divorced. Um, so in 1916 is when she and Jack married. Here's how I feel. <laughs> okay, so first of all, Olive and Jack were known for extensive partying. Um, Francis Marion, who I said about the, fla the movie The Flapper, this is something that she said. I have seen her often at the Pickford home, for she was engaged to Mary's brother, Jack. Two innocent-looking children, they were the gayest, wildest brats who ever stirred the stardust on Broadway. Both were talented, but they were much more interested in playing the roulette of life than in concentrating on their careers. So it was kind of like they were better off as friends than anything else, but that's what she was saying. And understand at that time, the word gay meant happy and full of life. And um, I'm pretty sure I don't have to explain that, but... <laughs> Sometimes you never know. But anyway, um, this is, you know, from everything that I have read about Olive Thomas and her relationship with Jack, I'm going to turn that off, um, you know, as an outsider looking into a relationship, I can imagine that the way that they acted, it seemed like, okay, yeah, you're acting immature. But I truly believe that they loved each other. Um, I also have a problem with how Mary Pickford treated the situation. I've read on several instances where, well, Charlie Chaplin said that she, that Mary was not good for um, Douglas Fairbanks. He basically said that she destroyed my friend. Um the Gish sisters avoided her, didn't want to have anything to do with her. They, you know, other people would say that she basically would make it so that if she didn't like you and you crossed paths with her, she would make sure that you didn't have a job in Hollywood. So, I have a feeling that a lot of the fighting that happened between Olive and Jack was instigated by Mary Pickford. I also can, I have a suspicion that Mary was jealous of Olive Thomas because in a short period of time, Olive Thomas had made several different films Mary didn't make that many films in that short amount of time. And Olive Thomas was pretty. She was talented. And, you know, there, there was just a lot going for her. And so, yeah, I, I think Mary... Well, and plus she said a lot of things about, she said a lot of negative things about Olive Thomas, and then once Olive Thomas was dead, Mary Pickford said, couldn't say anything bad about her. Which leads me to think, okay. <laughs> so anyway. And, and you'll see some of the things. Um, but anyway, um, 
Jack and Olive did not have kids. However, um, Olive had a nephew, and when his mother died, they adopted the child. However, it was never clear what happened to that child after Olive passed away. I don't know if Jack continued to raise the child, or if, you know, I'm pretty sure he wasn't heartless and didn't get rid of the child. I'm pretty sure he raised the, the boy. You know, um, the, the, the little boy was uh, six years old when they took him in, so. So anyway, um, yeah, a lot of people who witnessed their relationship said that there were con there was constant fighting and then they would make up and then they'd fight again and the Pickford family was known to not approve of Olive and I'm thinking okay yeah I had a relationship like that people would tell me how to deal with him people were telling him how to deal with me and then We'd be fighting, and then all of a sudden we'd be like, why are we fighting? And so then we'd make up, and then the next day we're fighting again. And then we'd ask, why are we fighting? So, yeah, it was just the toxic, the whole toxic thing was more because people wouldn't leave us alone. <laughs> and then it was like, later when we talked, we're like, okay, why did people not like either of us? It's ridiculous. And I think that Pick the Pickford family didn't like her because Mary was telling them not to. Again, I think it was a jealousy thing. But I can only speculate because I wasn't there. So here's something that Mary Pickford said in 1955. And I'm only going to read a little thing here. She says, uh... I could understand why Zegfeld never forgave Jack for taking her away from the folly. She and Jack were madly in love with one another, but I always thought of them as a couple of children playing together. So, she says something like that. She also says, I regret to say that none of us approved of the marriage at that time. You know, it's just, mother thought Jack was too young, and... Her sisters felt that Olive, being in musical comedy, belonged to an alien world. So they were trying to say that they didn't belong together. How is Jack too young? I think Jack was older than Mary. I think that's what I read. Oh no, he was the younger brother. The problem that I see with that is that that family was way too protective of Jack. That was another thing that I read on with them. They were incredibly protective of him. It was like he couldn't do anything. He couldn't have a life, and I think that was the only time he did have an actual life was when he was with all of Thomas, because when he remarried, again, they didn't like her. They liked her for, like, uh, I think a month, and then once again, <laughs> they're treating her like trash. I feel bad for Jack. He was a good-looking young man. So her death <laughs> which to this day it's like a mysterious thing and here's why so Olive and Jack decided to go on a on a honeymoon they didn't really have one because of course they were in <laughs> secret they married and they eloped and they decided to have this um Oh no, it was a second honeymoon. I guess they did go on a honeymoon. Anyway, they went to Paris. 
they're in Paris, they're partying up a storm. They go into their hotel. He falls asleep. She ends up drinking mercury, uh, ingesting mercury by chloride. And, I mean, it's like late, late in the morning. I mean, early, early, early in the morning. I think it was like 2, 3, 4 in the morning, somewhere in there. And the thing about it, though, is that the mercury bichloride wasn't for her. It was for Jack. So... What they what a lot of people believe is that she was looking for a container of you know like this flask or something of drinking water or even sleeping pills you know something else not the bichloride and you know she's so heavily intoxicated. She couldn't read the label on the bottle. She ended up going to the hospital and died five days later. And of course, accusations start. One of the most obvious is that he tried to kill her for insurance money. Well, somebody, a family friend had gone with um, Jack to the hospital. Um, and he said, that's absolutely absurd. He goes, I've watched them. And he says, yeah, they fight. But for you to accuse him of fighting, saying that she was fight fighting and... No, that never happened because another one was that she committed suicide because she was so distraught over the fact that they had a fight because of his cheating on her. And once again, the friend debunked that saying, they didn't fight. Stop with the fighting accusations. That did not happen. And uh, another one was that she was addicted to drugs and alcohol, which it was a sign of the times. Unfortunately, because I have um, researched a lot of these silent film actresses and actors, when your career starts to plummet, you turn to alcoholism or drugs and, or your doctor prescribes some, you know, back then a lot of the drugs that are addictive now, what we see as, you know, as a problem now wasn't so much a problem then. I mean, you know, it's just a sign of the times. Um, but yeah, it, you know, like the, the cocaine is the main one where they were giving cocaine out like it was candy. And one of the things that the newspaper started saying was that they were in Champagne, that she and Jack were part were hosting champagne and cocaine orgies and that was because of her addiction and it was like no and um her body was brought back to the u.s while on the ship he actually jack actually tried to commit suicide at least twice possibly three times and uh, it was just, on the death certificate, it says accidental death. But there's still a lot of people that say it could be something else. And uh, because it was so mysterious, this is considered, that is why it's considered the first... Um, scandal and plus because the media just sensationalized the crap out of it um, it, 
the next year would be the Fatty Arbuckle scandal, which would be even worse. And, um, but yeah, so, so that's all of Thomas. Um, Jack Pickford did marry again, but there were people that said that he just did not recover his first love. He did, in fact, love Olive Thomas. Um, I just, I blame his sister for totally destroying that. You know, for trying to destroy the marriage. He he married two other times after that. But, in fact, what did he... Yeah, he died almost ten years later. A little over ten years later. Um... And he died of alcoholism. But anyway, I, I think that, but he was plagued with depression as well. So I think it had to do with losing her. But anyway, so that is all of Thomas. Um, there is... There is a novel, and I'm actually interested in reading it. It was released in 2015, uh, and I hope I say this name right, Leoni, and I'll put it in the description. Leoni Giles released a fictionalized biography of Olive called The Forgotten Flapper. And I'm intrigued by it because it's based on factual information, and it goes f and it's narrated by her ghost. And if you don't know this, <laughs> I just found out last year. So the New Amsterdam Theater in New York City, where she performed um, in Zegfield and some of her other performances, it's said that her ghost resides in that theater. So I don't know if that's true or not. Some people say no. Other people have said that they have experienced her. So or have uh, felt her and whatever it is, but anyway. So she's still around. Or however you wanna. <laughs> so that is all of Thomas. Um, like I said, her death is considered the first Hollywood scandal because of how it was, more because of how the media um, decided to sensationalize it, and just of how mysterious it is, but if you look her up, she's a very pretty lady.